Welcome to Grace. I do want to kind of <clears throat> piggyback on one of those announcements. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is today, 5 o'clock in this room, is the Discovering Grace membership class. Excuse me. Sorry about that. And this class is two parts. Today, part one, 5 to 6.30. Part two tomorrow, 6.30 to 8. If you haven't yet taken this class, I urge you to take it. I think it's the only class you can take that will make you better looking and lose weight. Take this class. <laughs> Maybe that's not true. What is true is help you really get connected, find out how you fit in the body of Christ, find out your ministry, and find out your community, your, your connections, your friendships. And so after this class, everyone who takes it is invited to a seven-week small group. My wife Tracy and I, we get to know you, you get to know us, we help you really find out what your calling is and how you fit here. So I urge you, take it. Five o'clock here today, please come. Let's pray one more time, and let's look at the Word together. Father, we ask for the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit. Illuminate your Word. Give us understanding. Plant your Word in our hearts by the power of your Spirit, and make us more like Jesus because we're here today. In his name we pray. Amen. I want you to imagine that tomorrow morning you get a phone call from your bank. And your bank lets you know that somebody has given a tremendous amount of money to you. <clears throat> but there's one stipulation. You, have to, you can only spend $86,400 a day. And whatever you don't spend of that $86,400, by the end of the day, it is zeroed out until the next morning. <clears throat> the next morning, again, can spend $86,400. Whatever you don't spend, that next day is zeroed out again. Now, I think if we knew that was the case for us, I think we'd all think about how can I make sure to spend all $86,400 before the day's over? Well, there is a bank like that, <clears throat> but I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about time. Every day, each one of us gets 86,400 seconds. And every night, whatever we have not <clears throat> used for good purpose is zeroed out. There's no carryover balance of time to the next day. If you fail to use the day's deposit, use your time, then the loss is yours. There's no going back. There's no drawing against tomorrow's time. you got to live with today's deposits, and that's all. And the clock is running. You know, as I've studied uh, the life of Jesus for many years, I've noticed that he never seems to be in a hurry. You ever notice that? <clears throat> I mean, here is the one who's got the most important job in history, redeeming the world. He only has so, many, so much time to do what he came here to do, very limited amount of time, a few years. But as you read about the ministry, life ministry of Jesus, he never is in a rush. It takes time to consider the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. and it takes time to lay hands on children and bless them. And here you have a perfect example of somebody who knows how to manage their time. Let's look at a, a couple passages. Psalm chapter 90. <clears throat> Psalm 90. We'll look at verses 1 through 4, then we'll skip to verse 10 and verse 12. But let's just look at this. Psalm 90, starting in verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust, and you say, return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. Verse 10, as for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone, and we fly away. Verse 12. So teach us to number our days, 
that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Our life is so brief, Lord. It's, time flies by so fast, Lord. Would you teach us to number our days? Would you teach us how to live wisely with the little time that we have? Would you teach us how to make the most of our time? Now, the New Testament teaches the same thought, with some different words. Ephesians 5, 15, and 16 says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So again, there's this heart of, Lord, teach us how to be wise and make the most of our time. What I want to do this morning, I want us to take the word time, T-I-M-E, and come up with four important points about how we can be wise and make the most of our time. So this is an easy way for you to remember this message, just with the word time. We're going to go through each letter. And each letter tells us something very important we need to know if we're going to be wise and manage our time. The first letter, T, stands for treasure it. Treasure it. Everybody say treasure it. See, God says we should treasure time as this very valuable commodity. And the Bible gives us two reasons why we should treasure time. The first reason is, is because there's a very limited amount of it that you get. So you should treasure it. And the second is because how we live now with the time we have will determine how we live forever. So let's just look at that for a second. Why should we treasure time? First of all, because there's a limited amount of it. The Bible actually gives us 11 metaphors of the brevity of life. 11 metaphors. Let me walk through them. First one. It's like a dream that flies away. You know how you had a dream and the next morning you wake up and you forgot it already? Job 20, verse 8. Time is like a dream that flies away. It's a shadow that disappears. It's a shadow that disappears. First Chronicles 29, 15. It says a cloud that vanishes. You see the cloud and, and it's gone. Job 7, verse 9. It's like a flower that rises up and then dies, Job 14, verse 1 and 2. It says grass. Grass pops up and the sun, heat of the sun, causes it to wither, 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25. It says a vapor that vanishes. You see the vapor over the pond early in the morning and then it's gone, James 4, 14. It says a mere breath, Psalm 39, 5. In the winter you breathe and see it and then it disappears. It says nothing, Psalm 39, verse 5. It says a phantom, Psalm 39, verse 6. It says it's, a, it's like a sigh, Psalm 90, verse 9. Just, and it's over. Last one, 11th metaphor, it's as the wind that passes. Just the wind blows by and it's past us, Psalm 78, verse 39. So all these different metaphors, try, the Bible is trying to make it very clear to us that we don't have very much of time. It, our life is going to go by very, very fast. So we should treasure the time we have. Treasure it. You don't get, you have a limited amount of it, treasure it. Or like that country song goes, just blink and you're 100 years old. Last Thursday, one of our Church members Louise Olds turned, turned 98. It was her birthday. She still lives on her own. Trace and I went by on her birthday to just surprise her with a gift and got a chance to talk to her. And she would talk about her life. And she's like, it just all has gone by so fast. So our time, we, 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 have, we, meet, we have a limited amount of it. We must treasure it. Some of you have heard the expression, what's the most important thing on a gravestone? So on a gravestone, you have somebody's name, then you have like the date they were born, you have a dash, the date they died, sometimes maybe a verse or a poem or something, have some epitaph. What is the most important thing on the tombstone? What do, you, what do you think it is? Many of you know it's the dash. Why? Because the dash tells that that's that whole person's life is represented by the dash. They were born, they died, that was their life. Their life is the dash. And so our life is so brief, we need to treasure 
our time. We have a limited amount of it. The second reason why we should treasure it is because how we live now with the time we have will matter for eternity. It'll matter forever. As believers in Christ, we are all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of you, everyone who knows Jesus one day is going to stand before Christ, is going to be judged for the giving of commendation and rewards and future assignments in the kingdom to come. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So how we use our time will matter forever. How we live, are we going to live, are we going to use our time for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God? Are we just going to waste our time? Are we just going to spend it all on ourselves? How we use our time will determine in the kingdom to come the, the kind of commendation we receive, the kind of rewards we receive, and the assignment we're given, and so forth. It's all determined by how we manage our time. So we need to treasure it. It matters. It is, it is a very extremely valuable commodity, the most valuable of all. Treasure every moment that you have. A.W. Tozer wrote this. Time is a resource that is non-renewable and non-transferable. You cannot store it, slow it up, hold it up, divide it up, or give it up. You can't hoard it or save it for a rainy day. When it's lost, it's unrecoverable. When you kill time, remember, it has no resurrection. So understand that you know, we should treasure time. It's, it's the most valuable asset we have. Treasure it. Treasure because there's a limited amount of it, and treasure because how we live now with it will determine really how we live forever. So T stands for treasure it. Everyone say treasure it. Okay, I stands for invest it. Everyone say invest it. See, the thing about time is you can't save it. You can only invest it. Jesus tells a parable in Luke 19, the parable of the minas. In this parable, a businessman entrusts his wealth to the care of his servants while he goes away. When he returns, he evaluates what each of his servants did with what he gave them, and then he rewards them accordingly. Now, in this parable, this is different than the parable of the talents. The parable of talents is where each of us has different different amounts of, of something like different gifts, different abilities, different literal money. And then we are judged for how we invested what we have that's different with each other, our, our gifts and our talents, our abilities, our possessions, so forth. But in this parable, in Luke 19, all the servants are given the same amount. So what is it that we're all given the same amount of? What we're all given the same amount of is time. We each get 24 hours a day. And how we spend that time, how we invest that time, will determine how we're going to be rewarded by the master. Jesus, of course, is the master. Let's read Luke 19, 16 and 17. And the first appeared, the first one that he was entrusted to Mina, said, Master, your Mina has made ten Minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave. Because you have been faithful in a very little thing, be an authority over ten cities. So at the end of our lives, when we stand before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, we are going to be rewarded on the basis of how we invested our time. I want you to notice there's two aspects of this reward. There's a commendation, and then there's a future assignment. First, the commendation. I mean, many years ago, I didn't think that commendation was going to be that big a deal. Early in my Christian life, I thought, he says, well done, good servant. I just thought, whoop de doo that's not a big deal. The, the more I walk with the Lord, the more this becomes a bigger and bigger deal to me. Because the more the reality of that moment is going to be so, so important to us. Have you ever had somebody that you really respected actually uh, praise you in public? I mean, it really is a significant moment. Oh, some of you may know that uh, Tilly Bergen, who leads Mission Arlington, and Tilly has done a tremendous ministry over these last 36 years, Mission Arlington. Tilly and I go back, way back. We're, we're great friends. And, and uh, I helped her with Mission Arlington. I wrote her first, the first brochure of Mission Arlington. 
And so we've had this connection uh, for a long time. One time she was invited to speak at this conference, and it was a large conference of pastors. And I knew she was speaking, and just to be supportive of her, I just kind of slipped in the very back and sat down, kind of hiding back there. And she got up to speak, and she looks around, and she sees me, and she's, she says, well, there's Gary Hutchison, and she starts praising me publicly. And it mattered because of, of the love I have for her and the respect I have for her. It, it, was a, it was a significant moment. But that moment is nothing compared to when we stand before Jesus. I want you to imagine that moment. His face shines like the sun. His eyes are a flame of fire. Remember, when you look into those eyes, you're looking into the eyes of infinite love. And then he says your name, and when he says your name, you see his lips move. This is a real moment. I mean, this is going to be an extraordinary, awesome, glorious moment to hear him say your name and well done, that commendation. But then he doesn't stop there. Then, he, then, then you get a promotion. Okay, you were faithful with what I gave you. One of the things he gives us is time. He says, now you're over these 10 cities. Now you got a promotion. Now you have this. I can trust you with this forever. Time is more valuable than money. But, you know, money can, money can be spent, money can be invested, and money can be saved. But time can be spent, time can be invested, but time cannot be saved. In the early 1970s, Jim Crochet wrote, he wrote, the, wrote a song, and one of, the song, one of the lines in one of his the songs, the lyrics go like this. If I could save time in a bottle, you guys remember this song, the first thing I'd like to do it's to save every day till eternity passes away just to spend them with you. I mean, those are great lyrics, and it'd be nice if you could save time, but you can't. In fact, a few months after he wrote this song, he was tragically killed in a plane crash in Natchitoches, Louisiana at the age of 30. So you can't save time. And you know, it's funny because we have all these time-saving appliances Time-saving devices. I want you to show me all the time you save. Show it to me. Where is it? Say, we can't save it. We can't save time, but we can't invest it. Invest time. What we do is we tend to invest our time into what really is most important to us. And, for example, let me th let's just take a, just a, a regular week. A regular week has 168 hours. The average person will spend about 56 of those hours sleeping, about 24 of those hours eating and personal hygiene, about 50 of those hours working or in, and traveling back and forth to work. That means for the average person, there's about 35 hours a week discretionary time left over. That's about five hours a day. Five hours a day. And the question is, of course, where are you investing those hours, those five hours a day that you have you know, control over. I think, so, I think we'd all be kind of a, maybe a little bit embarrassed if someone were to follow us for about 10 days and kind of keep track of how we're spending our time for 10 days. If you follow someone for 10 days and saw how they spent their time, you could really determine what was important to them. Don't you, know, you believe that? For 10 days and you saw how they spent their time, you could really determine what was most important to them. And uh, it's also interesting, there's another study done by the University of Michigan. They studied 1,500 households. And they found that mothers working outside the home spend an average of 11 minutes a day on weekdays and 30 minutes a day on weekends with their children, not including mealtime. Fathers spend an average of 8 minutes a day on weekdays and 14 minutes a day on weekends with their children. And yet, those same parents, if you said, what really matters to you, they say, my family, my children. But yet, the way we spend time shows that something else must matter to us more than that, because so little time is spent there. And then you, people interject, but wait a second, but the time I spend with my family is quality time. And I really don't like that phrase, because people use that phrase, quality time, as an excuse for not spending very much time with their families. In fact, let's just test this. Let me, get, let me say I can give you a chance to choose between a $100 bill that's all wrinkled and got some tears in it and it's very low quality condition and a crisp brand new $5 bill. Which one would you take? 
See, quantity does matter more than just quality. So there's no substitute for us investing large quantity of time with what matters most, our relationship with God, our relationship with those we love, and those who love us, our relationship with people. So I stands for invested. Everyone say invested. Okay, now M in the word time stands for manage it. Manage it. Everyone say manage it. Ephesians 5.16 says, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So here's the thing. And we live in a world that the Bible describes as the days being evil. What does that mean? It means there is a, like a pull. A pull. If, we don't, if we're not deliberate about how we use our time, then there's a pull that we have to work against that's going to cause us to either waste our time or misuse our time. If we're not deliberate and careful to manage it, we will, we'll, we'll just misuse it and waste it. In fact, there was a time uh, management expert came and gave a talk on time management to a bunch of these business leaders. It was interesting because he did, he did an illustration that some of you might be familiar with. So he took out a vase, something like that, and he went and he said, and he put, began to put things in the vase. As he's putting them in there, everyone's watching. He's filling it up with these different balls and rocks and so forth. And then he says, he says I want you to notice as I'm filling this up, tell me when it's full. Everybody's watching, and he keeps putting things in there. And finally, he reaches a point where it comes to the top, and he can't get any more in there. And, he, and they say, it's full. He says, okay, is it full? He says, it's full. He says, okay, well, hold on a second. And then he takes some smaller rocks and opens this up. And he begins to pour them in all the cracks. He says, tell me when it's full, and he keeps pouring them in and pouring them in until finally they say, well, they said, that's full. He says, well, no, it's not. And then he gets some sand, and he begins to pour the sand in. Until it finally reaches a point where they, they say, yeah, it's full. He says, no, it's not. And then he gets some water. He pours it in. And he had enough water to actually fill it up. And he says, it's full. And they say, yeah, it's full. And he says, okay. He says, now what is the point of this illustration? And one of the guys raises his hand and says, the point is, no matter what, you can always squeeze more into your schedule. <laughs> he says, wrong answer. The point of this illustration is, if you don't get the big things in first, you won't get them in at all. And then he asks the question, what are the big things in your life? So that's a good question for all of us to think about. What are the big things in your life that you got to make sure you get in. What are those things that matter most to you? That you got to make sure that you manage your life in such a way that you get those things in. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33. He says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So Jesus is telling us there are, there are some priorities we've got to set. And uh, you know, people talk about, well, what matters most? The big things would say, the big things are my relationship with God. That's a big thing, okay? You got to make sure you get it in before all the little things squeeze it out. Okay, another big thing is my relationship <clears throat> with my family. Okay, that's a big thing. You got to get it in before the little things squeeze it out. What are the big things? Most of us would say, that, well, the big things are my relationships with those I love and who love me, God and, and family and friends and so forth. But yet, when you look at their schedule, those things are not put in first. Those things are like, if I have time, I get all the little things and I don't put the big things in first. Many of you are familiar with the song by Harry Shapin entitled, The Cats in the Cradle. Let me just read the words again to you because I want to tell you a little bit more about this song. Here's the words to the song. 
My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. He was talking before I knew it, and as he grew, he said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. My my son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, and I'll come. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. He walked away, and he smiled, and he said, you know, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. The final verse. I've long since retired, and my son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you, if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle, and the kids have the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's sure nice talking to you. As I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. Now, here's the rest of the story about this song. Harry Shapin's wife, Sandy, actually wrote the words to this song after their son, Josh, was born. And it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. When their son was seven, Harry was performing 200 concerts a year. And Sandy asked him, when are you going to make time for your son? And he said, at the end of summer, honey, I'm going to make time for him. But that never happened because before the end of summer, Harry's Volkswagen Bug was hit by a truck and he died. See, we must manage our time. We must set priorities. We make sure we get the big things. What are the big things that you really believe are the big things? Do, are you putting them in? Or are you letting the little things squeeze them out? <clears throat> so T stands for what? Treasure it. I stands for? Invest it. M stands for? Man. E stands for? Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Jesus says something interesting in Luke 12, 15. He says, Life does not consist of the things you possess. He's talking to someone who's arguing about whether or not they're going to get the will. He's talking about greed and covetousness. And he's letting them know that life does not consist in things. That's not where life comes from. Not real life. So where does it come from? What does life consist of? Life consists of relationships. That's where life comes pours out is through relationships, relationship with God, relationship with the, with the ones we love, relationships with people. That's why Jesus says this. When Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? Here's his answer. Matthew 22, verse 36, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So if you're going to experience life, if you're going to experience the fullness of life, the abundance, then you've got to prioritize relationships. Relationship with God, relationship with those that you love and who love you. Relationships with people. Yesterday we had a service for Dorothy Grasty, a memorial service, as she's now with the Lord. And it's always interesting. I've, I've done lots and lots of memorial services and funerals over the years. And people get up and they begin to share. They always begin to talk about <clears throat> those moments, those relationships, those encounters, those gatherings, those times together. That's what they talk about. Why? Because that's where life was. That's where life flowed. So all of us need to learn to say no to things that take us away from things that really give us life. James chapter 4, verse 14. One more verse I want you guys to see before we start to wrap it up. James 4, 14 says, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. So turn to the person next to you and say, You don't have very long to live. Isn't that the truth? I want you guys to see uh, this three-minute clip from the movie Dead Poets Society because I really think it captures what I want us to close with, this idea of E in the word time being we need to enjoy, enjoy it. So let's go ahead and run that clip. When he came in, 
Hopefully you got one of these cards. If not, please grab them on the way out. On one side it says, it's about time. Remember the word time. T, treasure it. I, invest it. M, manage it. E, enjoy it. On the back it says, carpe diem. I'd like to ask you guys to live with this card for a week. In your pocket, your purse, somewhere. And every time you feel it, just begin to think, you know, I need to, I need to seize the day. I need to maximize my time. I need to live with wisdom. And I need to enjoy my time. Enjoy relationships. Enjoy relationship with God and with those you love who love you. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we ask you for help, Lord, in managing our time with wisdom. We ask you to help us by the power of your spirit, your word, encouragement from others, that we wouldn't be wasting our time, squandering our time, misusing our time. Help us, Lord.